Uh, good morning and, uh, and welcome to the Rackham Graduate School. This is our wonderful uh, Rackham Amphitheater. Um, I'm delighted to welcome those who this is the first time attending this event. And I know there's a number of you that have been coming for a number of years. It's really delightful to have you here for this very special event. Um, as we get ready to hear from our main event, our outstanding uh, Rackham students about their research and scholarship, uh, I wanted to begin by sharing with you just a few thoughts about what we at the graduate school have been working on in the last year. I'm really excited to share this news with you uh, that we've, we've recently launched uh, a strategic vision for graduate education at Rackham. And this has grown out of our longstanding efforts to support our students and to drive innovation that impacts their academic experience. And in order to highlight for you what we see as the future of graduate education at the University of Michigan, I'd like to take a moment to discuss our past and present as a university and graduate school, and then how that sets us up uh, for this future vision. So looking first back at the past, um, as you would know as, as, uh, as, as alumni and those that are interested in the graduate school, our model of graduate education here at Michigan and across the nation at its core relies on a deep intellectual connection between faculty and a, often a specific faculty member and graduate students. More than a century old, this is often called the apprenticeship model of graduate education, and it's pr produced wonderful, important discoveries and new understandings of people and society. Even today, it draws both students and faculty from the world over to join us here at the university. But despite the many contributions this model has inspired for us in the past and even the present, we know there are some pressures on it that have been building up over time. So at Rackham, we have been working hard to stay ahead of these pressures and indeed lead the national conversation about the future of research-based graduate education, both masters and doctoral. So I'd like to take just a moment to highlight a few of the most pressing dynamics that are shown here in, uh, from some headlines from the national press and from the trade press. And these are informing our vision of what we should be focusing on in the future. First, I'd like to highlight the very idea of the apprenticeship model assumes that the apprentice will ultimately become, assume the role of the teacher mentor. However, this is not actually the case today in the year 2019. The reasons for this are complex. The number of PhDs outpaces available jobs in academia and the academic job market is increasingly tight in all fields. On the other hand, and at the same time, many of our graduates who are arriving here for their studies wish to pursue careers in industry, in nonprofits, in government service, in academic institutions that have primarily a teaching focus. These career pathways typically differ from the career paths of their mentors here at the, in the graduate school. I wanna to report to you that this shift is already well underway. At Rackham, more than half of doctoral graduates who are receiving their degrees are going on to careers that are very different from the tenure track positions that their mentors hold. At the same time, if we focus for a moment on master's training, uh, that, that those degrees are hard pressed to keep up with the demand for expertise in emerging fields and indeed the way in which emerging fields themselves are changing rapidly. At the same time, there's increased public skepticism about the benefits of evidence-based research like we focus on here in the graduate school and growing concerns about the affordability of graduate education. There are reports in the national and trade press that speak of a crisis in graduate student mental health and finally, there are rare but unacceptable cases of misuse or abuse of the faculty student dynamic that underpins this apprenticeship model of graduate education. So those are the pressures that we face, um, but at the same time, and perhaps most important of, uh, of all to me, we see that society has never had a need, a greater need for the advanced training of research-based graduate education, for evidence-based science, for expertise that cuts across multiple disciplines, for thinking from the social sciences and the humanities that can help people address deep societal problems and for the understanding that helps us talk across difference, communicate across difference. These are the essential elements of what scholarship for the public good means and it's really built into Rackham's mission. We feel that we have an opportunity to address both the pressures and seize the opportunity here at Rackham, especially at a university like Michigan, given our scope as a world-class research enterprise and also a national leader in graduate education. So because of those pressures and opportunities, Rackham is pursuing a new strategic vision for graduate education, which I mentioned um, just a moment ago. So in rethinking graduate education in this way, we really hold to three beliefs. 
The first is that graduate education needs to be student-centered. This means, what does this mean? Student-centered means that the students own scholarly and research interests, their needs for academic and professional development, and their career aspirations are increasingly incorporated into the design of their curriculum and their academic experience. And second, we think that this innovation to support the graduate act, the academic experience, to make it increasingly student-centered, should be faculty-led. It should be led by our faculty because they can respond to the needs of the discipline, to the needs of the students as they work within the disciplines. And the third piece is that Rackham can support faculty as they develop ideas and move them forward, and also support students to have these opportunities to engage in the sorts of experiences that are student-centered and, and expand their education. So based on this idea, um, we have, uh, we have uh, four uh, goals that we'll be focusing on in the next few years at the graduate school. The first, is what we're calling a reimagined academic experience in which faculty themselves are supported to innovate and experiment in offering new curricula, new kinds of experiential learning, and new types of interdisciplinary learning. Our second major goal is to strengthen diversity of the graduate school. In this goal, Rackham students from different backgrounds, with different life experiences, with different dif distances traveled to the university can thrive and have a sense of belonging within their academic programs. Our third major goal is to enhance partnerships and community. And this is in which all members of the Rackham community, students, faculty, staff, alumni, are welcomed into this work because we all have a role to play. And the last major goal is to strengthen the organizational culture and climate of Rackham itself, in which we will examine our own work and strengthen it to support what will be happening as part of this, uh, as part of this plan. Some of the efforts that have grown out of the conversation to reach this point are already underway. Um, we have been launching uh, initiatives around internships. Um, Rackham uh, is gonna be continuing internship, uh, offering internet experiences uh, across campuses. And we're gonna use a variety of different modes and models to try to pilot what works best within particular disciplines. As an example, already with the support from the Mellon Foundation, Rackham was able to fund internships for professional development in the humanities and social sciences. This involves summer experiences, for example, in museums, uh, curating collections, working in nonprofits. And we're also starting this year, expanding these opportunities for students in the biological sciences. So they too can hold internships that both advance their career uh, interests and also are well integrated into their academic experiences. A second activity that's launching at the moment is that we've established a graduate student mental health task force. This is a team of graduate faculty, graduate students, and mental health professionals, and their goal is to develop actionable ideas that can be used to support graduate students in their mental health and their academic progress. They are a core team that will be reaching out to the many organizations across campus that are currently engaged in this work and trying to coordinate it in a way that will directly benefit Rackham students. And finally, to kind of continue this idea generation, uh, we've been standing up a series of conversations with faculty and cabinet partners. We've been shaping this work in various ways. We've held retreats and engagements to, to arrive at this point with a range of campus partners. Um, that work began in summer 2018, so it's more than a, it's been going on for more than a year. And we've hosted already two symposium, one uh, about research uh, and graduate education in May, and one just with the, broader, with the broader campus community that was held here in this amphitheater uh, just two weeks ago. And uh, our next uh, step in this direction will be on February 7th. I'm pleased to announce that we'll be welcoming national leaders in graduate education here for a third symposium to engage with UM faculty on this topic and that is critical to the future of the university. So I invite you to visit the Rackham uh, website to learn more about our vision uh, for graduate education. Uh, uh, the website is here. Um, we have in particular some, just some information that will give you a sense of some of the nascent programs that are already active both at Rackham and uh, initiated by faculty across the university. They're extremely in innovative uh, and they show some of the things that are percolating across campus at the morning. So in coming years, I really hope to be able to continue with faculty, staff, students, alumni, other members of the community to advance this vision. And I'm looking forward to further conversations about it. Okay, so that was a few words about the future. Uh, now I wanna kind of bring our uh, attention back to the present and our six outset, uh, looks like seven, right? I did, right, I didn't get the, got six, but it's seven and that's perfect. Uh, it will be seven, six better. Um, where uh, we'll hear about their research and they're gonna share their perspectives about uh, being graduate students in Michigan. So I invite you all to come, come up and uh, then we'll get going. Thank you.
so uh, this will be a, uh, this, uh, this, the way we'll have this organized is I'm going to let each student, I'm going to start with Yvon Chen, who's going to introduce himself. Each student is going to speak just for, you know, less than about five minutes about their area of research and scholarship. We'll kind of move our way one by one down. And then at that point, we'll open this up for general discussion and questions. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to, uh, I'll be here to kind of MC, but um, from past experience, my role is just kind of let everybody go and we'll have a nice conversation. So we'll start with you. Thank you. Sure. Before, saying, uh, before that, uh, can I say I prepared something for seven minutes? Because the email say I can have seven minutes. Okay, can sounds good, right? Okay. Well, well, go ahead and go okay. ahead and go right thank ahead. Thank you, I appreciate yep. it. So, good morning, everyone. My name. Oh, it's it's on. On. Okay. good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I forgot to turn it on. My name is Yi Ren Chen. I'm a fourth year doctoral student from the higher education program. I received the Karma Scholarship this year. This is a scholarship that recommended by my program, selected by Rakim, and made possible by the generosity of our donors. So I want to first take this opportunity to thank you all for giving, giving me this award, I, and I'm, I'm deeply honored. Um, in terms of academic work, my research centers around uh, college choice. I ask questions like, uh, how do students choose college? Why do they make, make such decisions? And what are the consequences for themselves and for the society at large? My current research uh, focuses on academic undermatching, a phenomenon describing some high-achieving students do not attend the colleges that match their academic strengths. This pattern concentrates among uh, the uh, disadvantaged students, and so the research researchers and the policymakers believe that if we can address this problem effectively, we can help the underprivileged students to get a better future. The prior research suggests that there are two reasons that students uh, go undermatched. First, the lower ranked colleges might be actually work better for the students for a variety of reasons, such as close to home. If staying close to home is important to you, then you may choose colleges nearby over a more, a, a, a more prestigious university that is that far away. Second, maybe the students don't have the accurate information about colleges so that they are not making informed decisions. For example, empirical uh, evidence suggests that the first generation students are particularly bad at evaluating the institutional quality. Often they have an attitude to say, college is a college is a college. If there's no difference between colleges, then why not go to the college nearby? So this is clearly something that we can do. And the policy intervention in the past 15 years uh, focused primarily on providing information to the students. While I acknowledge both reasons are valid, I think undermatching is more complex than that. And my research explores the role of educational aspiration in the process of decision making. Following Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, I argue that people are loss averse. When making decisions, they do not evaluate the alternative based on the absolute benefit and the cost of that alternative, but evaluate the alternatives against some sort of benchmark. The importance of benchmark is that it determines whether an alternative will be perceived as a gain or a loss. If the alternative is better than the benchmark, then it is a gain, otherwise it is a loss. And the Kahneman's research shows that the same amount of difference um, may carry more weight when it happens on the losing side than on the winning side. In other words, the pain of losing $5,000 is much more intense than the pleasure of gaining $5,000. In the context of a college choice, I argue that the benchmark is largely determined by one's educational aspiration. The college that you believe you are able to get in serves as a reference point, and that will change how you perceive the rest of the um, uh, decision-making scenario. For example, let's say there's a student applied to both the University of Michigan and Harvard, and just for the sake of discussion, let's assume that the students think Harvard is better than Michigan. We all know it's not true, but people are entitled to their own opinion, so and I, I respect that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Now assume that student considers Michigan as a, her reference point. Then if she's lucky enough to get into Harvard, that's good for her. She will perceive that as again, and something that, that is something better than what she was expecting. But if Harvard rejects her application, then she probably will still be quite happy to spend four years in this charming place. On the contrary, um, if she considers Harvard as her reference point, then Michigan would become her de facto safety college. And in that case, if she is rejected by Harvard, then she has to choose to attend Michigan because she has nowhere to go. Then she might be a grumpy freshman on the, on the campus. 
For the same student, the perceived difference between Harvard and Michigan should be the same. However, depending on the reference point, the gain from Michigan to Harvard and the loss from Harvard to Michigan will be perceived quite differently. And that's the influence of the benchmark. My hypothesis is that students in general will not actively pursue the colleges that are below their reference point because otherwise they will go into a situation called a sure loss. That means that if you choose that alternative, then no matter what will happen, you lose. And Kahneman's research shows that because people hate losses so much that they in general will not choose true loss alternatives. Now applying this argument to the undermatching phenomenon, I hypothesize that if you go to ask the students who went undermatch, how do they feel about the uh, college of their choice? They probably will say something like, it's not the best college in the world, but uh, it's, a, it's a good enough option for me. If that is the case, then some of the undermatching problem may not be caused by the lack of information, but by the lack of aspiration. Accordingly, if we want to address the undermatching problem more effectively, we need to not only keep providing information to the students, but also need to incorporate the aspiration component into the intervention. Um, so that's my research. And that finally, I want to um, once again acknowledge the importance of the scholarship to my research. That frees me from uh, the work duties that I have been considerably accelerated uh, my research progress. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Kara Janis. Um, you might say that I am a disease detective um, working on a case that has global and local implications. So um, before I take the opportunity to share a little bit about my research and background, um, I do want to extend um, a heartfelt um, thanks to Rackham um, and the donor community. Um, I'm kind of coming um, back to academics after um, a unique um, experience working with the World Health Organization for some years. Um, and the funding um, and space that Rackham has provided um, for this opportunity to lead the employment market has been really important um, for my research and just the opportunity to be back here at Michigan. Um, I've been able to um, uh, undertake some of my dissertation research in Kenya over the past summer with um, a research international um, Rackham award, um, as well as some other funding opportunities. So again, um, very appreciative of this community. Um, my research uh, focuses on identifying and characterizing um, the determinants of immunization uptake, um, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the thing about um, what uh, impedes uptake um, of immunization generally is one to be um, a diverse set of reasons, but the implication is the same, that we have susceptible communities. Um, largely, the global immunization um, kind of practice has focused on this indicator of 95% coverage um, to um, protect children. And now many um, countries have family-oriented programs around adolescents and adults as well. Um, but what that doesn't get at is if you have an isolated community that has either zero protection or untimely protection, um, you're opening up the wider community to risk. Um, so I look at trying to use classical statistical methods to predict the determinants of where these clusters are um, that then map often to um, disease acquisition that can result in sustained transmission and the loss of some incredible gains that globally we've been able to achieve with immunization. Um, we like to say in the immunization community that we're often um, a victim of our own success um, with kind of eradication has come equivocation um, and to an extent kind of complacency um, taking hold of um, just behavior change. Um, and, you know, while in higher resource settings, we talk a lot about vaccine hesitant sentiments and outright refusal. Um, a lot of that is just um, at its root um, an opportunity for education and conversation. Um, instead of um, blame and, and kind of um, pointing the fingers. Um, we found in our research um, taking um, kind of hold of that relationship between the practitioner um, and patient, um, there is an opportunity to kind of reverse those um, uh, sentiments. Um, and then in the settings that I work with, where generally it's an issue of access, 
um, we're looking to kind of identify where those access barriers are um, to inform uh, more successful programming um, and outreach. Um, but again, the implication is the same, um, that where you have these clusters of under on or untimely vaccinated populations, um, we're at risk for um, resurgence, reemergence of diseases that have largely been eliminated and eradicated. In fact, Britain last year lost its elimination status um, for measles. Um, the Americas as a whole um, lost it, which was a huge um, kind of heartbreak for me personally, because I previously um, worked at the Pan American Health Organization, or was, was part of the effort um, in um, achieving that elimination status. And we're quite close to losing it here in the US. Um, so. Um, my research, um, I hope to continue to um, use the skill sets that I'm gaining through um, my program to um, continue uh, kind of this global achievement of um, eliminating and eradicating vaccine preventable diseases. Um, I don't think I got a chance to say, but I am um, in the PhD program uh, uh, in epidemiologic sciences and our great school of public health here at the University of Michigan. And I would, um, welcome the opportunity to start continue discussion during the Q&A or an open lunch. Hello. This is better. Okay. Hello, my name is Gretchen Reddy and I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology. And Rackham has supported me in every part of the faculty um, and really every stage of the project that I'm about to tell you about. Um, so I am interested in understanding the emotional and cognitive underpinnings of social relationships and what their function is in our lives and how they're shaped by power and knowledge over time. And I study social relationships in wild chimpanzees that live at Ngogo in Kigali National Park in Uganda. Um, and this is a place where chimpanzees have been studied for 25 years, um, which seems like a very long time, but chimpanzees can live to be over 70. So in their lifespan, um, that's actually a very short time. Um, and the chimpanzees I study specifically are adolescent and young adult males. And like humans of that age, um, adolescent males occupy this very liminal social space. Um, they begin to travel independently from their mothers when they're about 12. Um, but they're kept on the outskirts of the social world of adult males. And adult males, when um, adolescents are around 10, withdraw all the affection they used to show them, and they start to target them with aggression. And adolescents become aggressive themselves, and they regularly attack and eventually dominate all females in their community. And in my research, I examine how dominance, aggression, and affiliative relationships, like friendships, um, shape the social relationships between male and female and how these contribute to male reproduction, which in um, the evolutionary process is the main currency of success. Um, so, um, in the, just to give you some background, in most mammal species, uh, mothers are the primary caregivers of offspring, um, and I think many of us <laughs> know that since we are ma mammals, um, but offspring care requires so much time and energy from mothers that at any given moment, very few females are able to mate and conceive. And this causes a shortage of mates for all males in the animal kingdom. This is the biggest challenge for their reproduction. And they need to fight other males to obtain matings. And in these contests, the males that win are usually really big, strong, and experienced males. Um, however, um, relatively weak and small and young males still manage to reproduce in a lot of species. Um, and we call, um, in animal behavior research, we call the strategies they use alternative <laughs> tactics even though sometimes they're highly successful and widespread. Um, and um, they're just anything that allows a male to avoid direct combat. And in our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, um, multiple males and multiple females live together in communities where members of both sexes mate promiscuously. Um, so they're not pair bonds like those we see sometimes in humans. Um, and these groups that they live in have up to 200 members. And um, males, um, even though everyone mates with everyone in chimp communities. Males don't sire equal numbers of offspring. So high-ranking males um, have the most offspring and they achieve the status by competing with other males and fighting with them. Um, but even before they're contenders in this hierarchy, 
um, they do they can still father offspring. Um, so adolescent males, even though they're small and socially and physically immature, like adolescent humans, uh, manage to have a lot of offspring. So in my research, um, I tried to figure out how this happens. Um, and I studied um, the behavior of 20 adolescent males and 10 young adult males. Um, so this is males ages 9 to 20 years old, which is similar to males 9 to 20 in humans. Um, and I recorded every, all of their social interactions for two years. And I found that they um, mated with females by forming strong affiliative bonds with them. Um, and in these relationships, um, males and females would groom each other, um, they would spend time resting together, holding hands, embracing each other when they were frightened. Um, and males also were really, really um, affiliated with the offspring of their females. So they would groom them and play with them as well. Um, but despite the affiliative nature of these relationships, males also directed aggression to these females. Um, and, and this aggression also involved intimidating them, shaking branches to scare them, um, doing things to sort of restrict their movements and where they went. Um, and I found that, that um, the affiliative and aggressive aspects of these relationships influenced influence mating success differently as males got older. So males, chimpanzees become dominant to females when they're around 15 years old. So when they were younger than 15, the only thing that determined how often they mated with a particular female were the affiliated behavior. So how often they were sitting near each other, holding hands and grooming. Um, and as they got older, aggression also started to improve their mating success. So not just how often they were grooming the female and being nice to her, but how often they were shaking branches at her and um, causing her to fear them and sort of controlling her movements. And um, But um, even, even in that case, I found that um, the aggression influenced mating success only when it was happening within a really strong affiliative relationship. So if a male was aggressive to a female he didn't have a bond with, she wouldn't listen to him um, that she, they would in these relationships. Um, so taken together, these results um, sort of, they um, inform our understanding of how male chimps reproduce, but they also have important implications for understanding relationships in humans. Um, so male chimps and females form highly affiliated relationships, um, and these bonded pairs mate, and they have offspring together, and males have really strong bonds with these offspring, and they're really gentle and um, affiliated with them, um, but males also dominate females, um, and then and they sometimes use coercion to control their behavior. Um, and these are things that, some disturbing things we see in our own species too. Um, so as I mentioned, Raglan has supported this research through a number of stages. I, um, it supported my first summers going out to this chimpanzee research site. So all the data I collected, I was only able to do after I'd already learned how to find chimpanzees in the forest, follow them for 12 hours a day, um, navigate and not get lost, um, and learn to identify all of them. So they're now as familiar to me as any person is. I can't really describe how I recognize any one individual in one, with one particular detail, just as a person I know. Um, and um, when I went out to conduct the main research, um, or main data collection, the two years of data collection I did, um, Rackham also supported that research time. Um, and now that I'm back, um, they're supporting me to write up the results of my research, and that allows me um, time to write about all of this, but also to work on other academic activities, one of which is writing a policy um, and prevent, um, coming up with action, like, um, actions to take to prevent sexual misconduct at remote field sites, which is something that's really common in my field. Um, we're working out of these places where everyone is living together in tents and together and really isolated for long periods of time. So that's something that's really important to me. Back has allowed that to happen. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Iafredi, but please call me Joe. I am in my sixth year in the PhD program in applied physics working in the physics department. And my sixth year in the program is going to be my best year and should be my last year as well. I want to thank Rackham for giving me the pre-doctoral fellowship to support me through this sixth year so that I have time to finish up the really exciting projects that I've been working on over the past five years. So if I wanted to sum up my research in applied physics for you in one sentence, I would say that I hit semiconductors with lasers today to get us better electronics tomorrow. 
So let me give a little more detail on what I'm talking about. So who here has some electronics with them? Maybe a cell phone, a tablet, a laptop computer. I can see quite a few of these just from here uh, on the panel. Technology is amazing and it gets better and better every year. And one, one thing that has been a part of that, one drive that has been a part of that is something that's called Moore's Law. Has anyone heard of Moore's Law here? So Moore's Law is this industry drive to make the little electronic components on computer chips smaller and smaller to make the, to have the ability to have twice as many on a chip every two years or so. Now, that sounds great and it's led to a lot of cool innovation. However, that can't last forever. Eventually, you're going to get so small that you're gonna run into different physical barriers such as heating or so small that uh, physics doesn't work quite the way you expect it to anymore. So, if we're gonna keep innovating, keep getting better and better electronics, even if we're gonna run up against a size limit, we might need to rethink how we think about electronics. So electronics comes from the word electron, right? That's that tiny negatively charged particle that hangs out in atoms. And electronics use currents, flows of electron charge. We turn those currents on and off. That's how you get the sorts of electronic chips we have today. But electrons have more than charge. They have this really quirky quantum property called spin. And spin is really cool and could be the key to a new form of electronics that has been called very appropriately spintronics. So instead of using the charge of the electron, what if you could use the spin? Now I haven't told you what the spin is. If you wanna know more about that, we can have a 10 to 30 minute discussion after, after this where I can wax poetically about electron spin. But the idea is a fundamentally different kind of electronic device. Now, if you wanted to build such a device, you'd need to check off a couple of boxes. You'd need to have some material where you could align electron spins. Now, I wanna say here, I'm not doing quantum computing. That's another buzzword you might be familiar with where we might look at a single electron spin. Instead, I'm looking at lots of electrons, billions and billions and billions in tiny materials the size of my fingernail. And so we would need to have a way to access those electron spins. That's one thing we'd have to figure out. We'd have to figure out how, like what, how to manipulate them and what happens to them just naturally. And then we would need to figure out a way to measure them or detect them. And so my research has intersected with a few of these questions over my time at Michigan. Luckily, I work with a material known as gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide is used in things like red LEDs. So if you've seen a red LED, you might have seen gallium arsenide in your life. And we can use a laser to access the electron spins. We can align all of these spins together. We can also use a laser to figure out how well they stay aligned sometime later. And when I say time, I'm not talking seconds, I'm talking picoseconds. That's trillions of seconds, which is a really, really short time. And we're able to do that using uh, mirrors and lenses and a, a whole table full of optical elements. And so we want to know what happens once we've aligned electron spins and then when we measure them, what happens in between? And there are lots of complicating factors there, one of which I mentioned atoms before, and atoms have nuclei, the protons and neutrons at the center. Those also have spin, and so the electron spins and the nuclear spins interact, they're they're going back and forth throughout this really short time scale I'm talking about, and we wanna understand that interaction. If we can answer all three of these questions, how to align electron spins, how to manipulate, and also figure out what's going on with them when we're not looking, and then detect electron spins, if we can answer all three of those questions, we could identify materials that could then be used to make spintronic devices. So as I've, I've hinted at, I'm not a device person myself. I'm trying to lay the groundwork for these devices by understanding the underlying spin physics. And so, like I said, I'm over in Randall Lab on the Diag, hitting semiconductors with lasers over and over and over again, uh, using magnetic fields, electric fields, using a whole host of physics, things out of my physics toolbox to understand the spin physics so we can hopefully have a 
dare I say it, faster, better uh, spin-based future. So that's where my research is interested. That's the 20-year goal that we're looking at in the future. But another thing other than the Rackham Predoctoral Fellowship that I'm grateful to Rackham for has been uh, opportunities to explore what my own future might be in less than 20 years. And so one, one such thing has been conference travel grants. So I've been able to travel to the big conference for my professional society, the American Physical Society. I've been able to go to our March meeting, which is a meeting of over you know, 11,000 speakers covering all sorts of physics. And that's given me the opportunity to hear what the new up-to-date research is in my field try to establish connections with other graduate students and researchers. And that, that's been great to see what that life as a researcher might be like. In addition, one question that I've had for all graduate school that's unrelated to physics has been how do we as researchers communicate our work to audiences who haven't gone through the same education that we have? Uh, so I've been highly involved in a group here at Michigan called Relate, which trains researchers in communication fundamentals. And we've been very lucky to have the support of Rackham as we go about the university being invited to give workshops on how do I talk about my science with my neighbor, with my grandma, with this person down the street. I've been lucky enough to take a summer workshop nine weeks, uh, once a week, to work on my own communication skills and then have had the opportunity the last two years since the beginning of 2018 to help train others in this same thing. And Rackham has funded us through the Rackham Interdisciplinary Workshop Program to reach, in the times that I've been teaching, at least 60 uh, University of Michigan uh, postdocs and graduate students here over the summer, as well as hundreds of other folks, both at Michigan and elsewhere through workshops throughout the year. And we've also had the support of some great faculty members, some of whom may have been maybe in the audience right now. And so as I think about how communication might factor in my future career as well. I'm really grateful for the opportunity Rackham has given while also getting to do cutting edge research as well. So I'd be happy to talk about physics, communication, or anything in between. Thank you for listening. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Maribel Pia. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Chemistry. Um, but I first want to say it's really exciting to be here. Um, I'm pretty new, as you hear, I'm second year. Um, so I'm really just starting to get in the net and grit of my research. Um, so hopefully you guys find it interesting. I do. It's a little gross, but <laughs> I'll definitely see how you feel about it later. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to thank Rackham for giving me so many opportunities. Um, Rackham actually has funded me from the beginning of my program. So I'm a Rackham, Mer Rackham Merit Fellow. Um, so they've funded me for the first two years of my program, um, which has been great. Um, I'm originally from the Virgin Islands, so this negative 35 weather probably would not have put me in the best mood to be teaching students in January. So I'm exceptionally happy to have been funded for those first two, so, um, first two years. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the donors who helped that happen. Um, it was fantastic. Um, so a little bit about my research. Um, so. I would define my research as natural product drug discovery. Um, but to say it plainly, um, I have two major projects. Um, I'm going to focus on one, but feel free later to ask me about my second project. Just for the sake of time, I would only want to focus on one today, um, for at least this panel. Um, but my focus is on the oral microbiome. Um, so why would I be interested in that? Um, so recently, research has kind of discovered how the, um, the bacteria in our body are actually pretty important for like systematic diseases that we have. Um, I particularly focus on the oral microbiome, but recently, um, right now, actually Harvard is doing a study on the gut microbiome, particularly um, in um, stomach diseases, um, particularly Crohn's disease. And they're showing how when you have spurts or like inflammation during Crohn's disease, they're actually correlating it with certain bacteria that are proliferating in your stomach at that time. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Um, how like certain bacteria can really affect your, your daily function and like your, your system, um, your regular system. So what I study is how oral microbiomes also affect our, our systemic diseases as well as oral diseases as well. Um, so I study natural product chemistry. So if you guys don't know, like when you have gingivitis or other oral diseases, it's kind of caused by fluctuations of bacteria in your mouth. 
to your bacteria kind of goes through this really interesting evolutionary system where they kind of balance each other out. It's kind of like a fight to the death most of the time, if you think about it that way. Um, but they regulate each other quite efficiently, um, using different metabolites as signals to let one know, okay, you can't grow anymore. It's enough. Like you're kind of taking over. Um, so when we're uptaking or where we're kind of contracting these oral diseases, what's happening is our theoretically bad bacteria is overpopulating our mouth. It's causing this producing too many metabolites that's causing other signals or downregulating the growth of the good bacteria that would kind of keep it balanced. So what I study is what metabolites that these different bacteria in our mouth are producing to see how we can regulate ourselves and have a natural, um, have a natural substance that we can regulate, like incorporate with our body that's not foreign, but it's just already naturally produced, but can also help us balance out the bacteria that's growing, overgrowing in our mouth and causing these oral diseases. Um, and that's just one component of this project. But what's really fascinating is that they found that some of our oral microbiome can actually be humongous biomarkers for other systemic diseases. Um, right now, I'm studying how different um, oral micro, different bacteria in your mouth are proliferating when you have like different cardiovascular diseases or have diabetes. Um, so that's actually been a really big part of my project um, to see if we can actually use bacteria within your mouth as biomarkers for disease in general. Um, so that's like a major component of my research. Um, but um, this is really important for me just because Rackham has definitely funded a lot of the experiences that I've had outside. Um, and being a Rackham Merit Fellow, I've been introduced to a really large community of other graduate students on campus that have allowed me to learn a lot more. Um, my project is a lot, a lot of it is partially um, statistic based. And I can definitely tell you I have no background in statistics, absolutely not. And is definitely not my strong suit, but through these communities, I was actually able to gain a friend who has been exceptional in my research because they have offered to help me so much with it. Um, doing statistical analysis, and this is like a really big part of my, da my data, and being able to correlate these different, um, um, yeah, th th these different metabolites and exactly what they mean. So I'm really gra grateful for Rackham. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, some of you may be familiar with the uh, uh, genome, the Human Genome Project. Uh, that was completed a couple, almost two decades ago, 2003. The main objective of the Human Genome Project was to pin down all the different human genes, their physical location in respect to each other, and, and their function. Uh, so this was a massive uh, multinational collaboration uh, that, as you can imagine, impacted many uh, fields in science. But particularly, uh, it allowed us to look at human evolution at a very different scale. So one of the most interesting uh, findings from, uh, that stemmed from, from this project and other research that followed years after was that some populations of humans have a significant proportion of Neanderthal genes in their genome, some of them up to 5% of, of, of Neanderthal genes in their genome. And uh, uh, an important subset of these genes have immune functions. So human acquire uh, this variation through interbreeding uh, with uh, Neanderthals. So this uh, hybridization that's what's happening in Eurasia, uh, 60 to 40,000 uh, years ago. So humans were interbreeding with Neanderthals. Um, we, uh, you might be aware, we don't do that anymore. Uh, we have uh, those uh, archaic hominins have been extinct for, for a long time. And so it's kind of difficult to know what exactly uh, happened uh, with all this uh, hybridization and this interaction in terms of the genes. Uh, but fortunately, there are some species of primates that still do hybridize. Um, and I'm very lucky to work in a lab where we have one of the few well-characterized hybrid zones of, uh, of primates. These are the Haldor, uh, hybrid zone with howler monkey species, the mantle howler monkey and the uh, black howler monkey in, in Southeast Mexico. And this allows us to, to look at what is the effect of, of hybridization, this interaction of these two species in terms of the, of the immune genes, can they be passing these, these favorable 
or advantageous genetic variants from one another. So that's mainly the, the scope of, of, my, of my research. Um, so from Brackham, I've been able to uh, travel to the field, do all this sample collection uh, with the uh, um, Rackham International Research Award. And then also I've been uh, able to bring back my samples, process them, get all these data. And also this has been done through uh, some research, couple of research grants from, from Rackham. Uh, and also again, Rackham has allowed me to present my work at different places. So the help I received from Rackham has been tremendous. But I think some, sometimes it's just, um, it's missed that it's not just the, how Rackham support students and how this helped advance science and particular in our field. It also has a very deep impact in, in people. So I, my, in my program, there is a big teaching component to that. I did my master's here and have taught for, I think, 12 terms now. So, um, so without that, without your support, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell my students what it's like to go to the field and do all this research, what it's like to do data, what it's like to be a grad student here, and you know, hopefully inspire them to, to be scientists. Also, I've been able to um, go and do these outreach programs that also uh, that go to high schools here in Ann Arbor, Detroit, or programs that we bring in like FEMS uh, uh, to just show high school students how, how science is done and what is, uh, what is the process behind it. Also some other programs in the, in the, in the museum, in the uh, new building uh, in central campus that you, you might know of. So, so yeah, the impact is, is, is really, really high also on, on other people and promoting science particularly. Now I run into some other students of mine. They're in grad students now, they're in PhD programs, they're in, uh, in medical school. So it's your help does not impacts me, impacts a lot of people here. And I think uh, it's just a, a, how do I say this? Just my, my little uh, um, giving back to the community here for, for the help I receive. And so I just wanna say thank you for that. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Move it closer. Hello, I'm Dongyan. I'm Zhang Yan. Um, I'm a music composer. Okay. Yeah. I'm Zhang Yan. I'm a music composer, and I'm currently studying music composition in the music department. Um, I'm currently a fourth year doctoral student, and it's typically a third, three year program but I'm very grateful to have one more year to finish my dissertation. Yeah. So talking briefly about my background, I'm Korean. I came to the United States when I was 16. So I came here for high school and then I went to college in uh, Ohio and then I'm still here, I'm 29. So it's been uh, 13 years since I've been in the States. So talking about my project, my project is basically a music video for the string quartet that I wrote myself. My string quartet is in five different movements and it's a music video for my string quartet that features two dancers and the string quartet as well as my own music. So my string quartet is called Han and Han is supposedly a uniquely Korean concept. Han, I don't know if you're familiar with a concept called Han, but it's a unique type of Korean concept 
that supposedly that Koreans have developed during their experience of violence and oppression during the time where, when they're colonized by Japan. And it's very interesting because it's a passive type of emotion that is potentially very explosive. But what I find it really interesting that it's passive. So it's a mixture of feelings that are contradicting to one another, including it's mainly a form of grief and also anger and wanting to revenge. But then you also have passion, hope, and there's happiness there too. So I think that although that concept is a uniquely Korean concept, but it's something that everybody can communicate with. Everybody has Han in their life. So in this video, I'm talking about my Han and my experience as navigating in different uh, cultural references and my experience as a woman and a female composer in the field where the composers are actually uh, still mostly uh, Caucasian and male. So my, uh, my piece, talking about my piece itself, it's in five different movements. Uh, in the first movement, I set a Korean folk song called Bird Bird Bluebirds. It's seya, seya, parang seya. So I set it in my first movement. And then in the second movement with a string quartet instrument, I try, try to emulate the color of pansori, which is a type of uh, Korean theater. It's usually featuring a Korean uh, female singer who has a very brash, breaking and dark uh, uh, voice quality that's also very nasally and forward, but very hushed and breaking. And I try to emulate that uh, color in my second movement. And my third movement incorporates a Korean drum called Django. It's an hourglass drum. And then there are two sides to it. With left hand, you use your hand. And then on the right hand, you have a stick. So I use Django in my third movement and then uh, try to use it together with a string quartet instrument. And my fourth movement is called Mu. So it's a cello solo movement featuring actually just the concept of mu. Mu means nothing or nothingness, or I think maybe we're more familiar with the concept of like Zen or being empty. So in this movement, I don't have any melodies or anything that you can relate to, but I use a register contour and dynamics to communicate like the grief and anger in the fourth movement. In fifth movement, it's called maum. Maum means heart or mind in Korean. And in this movement, I specifically incorporate a Buddhist chant. So uh, the lyrics involve mainly repetitious calling of Amita Buddha. So they keep going, uh, Namu Amitabu, Namu Abitabu. So Namu Abitabu is basically calling uh, Amitabura, which symbolizes cosmic energy in Buddhism. So I'm calling the cosmic energy and I juxtapose it with the concept of Maum, which is a, a Maum in individual person. So I juxtapose between the cosmic energy and the concept of individual mom there. Um, what else should I talk about? <laughs> so that's the gist of my pieces. And I have two dancers that are uh, singing, uh, not singing, acting, and also dancing for my music video. Uh, we recently did a video shooting at a private farm in Wolverine, Michigan. And this, uh, Dancer actually flew from Tokyo, Japan. He's a Buto dancer. I don't know if you're familiar with a Buto dance, but uh, they developed Buto dance in Japan as a reaction to creating something of their own uh, because they thought that their dances were uh, prominently Western during that time. So it was uh, this Buto dance was used to talk about taboo topics in Japan as well as bizarre and things that we cannot conceive as human beings. So this is uh, uh, currently, 
how my project is going. Uh, the project is almost done except a couple more recordings and the video streams for the musicians. And I'm happy to share the photos and any other things that I have during our lunch. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to finish my project. It's been a really wonderful experience meeting all these uh, artists from different disciplines. And this is basically a prototype for what I want to do as a music composer in the future and as possibly a music faculty as well. So thank you so much for making this happen. Thanks very much, everyone, for sharing your research and your stories. So we're, uh, now we have, we have time for questions. So I would welcome uh, you to engage directly with our panelists with questions you might have. We have one right here to start, and we have a microphone. Uh, If you just call it close, it'll it should work. First, there we go. First, I want to thank all of you for very fine explanations for those of us who are not in any of these fields. So I appreciate that. And I'm curious to know a little more about you as human beings, where you came from, how it is you came to choose the career path you have chosen, and what brought you to Michigan, University of Michigan in particular? A couple you were willing to to speak on that? Yeah. Working? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm from Mexico. I did my undergrad there. I've lived uh, there my whole life. I came here uh, for my master's program and I'm now PhD. So I chose Michigan because the, the university is really good, right? It's top notch, right? So. Uh, it's not Harvard, but <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, but yeah, no, I was really interested in my department in particular. It's uh, one of the uh, top top three in the nation now. Uh, so we have a very diverse uh, group of people working on many, many things. So for me, it was a very easy choice when I got the, um, the admissions, uh, the offer to, to come here. And, you know, uh, it's been, it's been, uh, the adjusting to everything has been, um, I would say, easier than, than than what I thought. To be honest, you know, you, there, you have many many resources for any any particular uh, problem that you might face, from mental health, from uh, funding, for uh, for any any anything. I, I I cannot, you know, we have this great also um, benefits program and. So I was very, very lucky, very lucky to be here and continue to do my, my PhD here. And I don't know, as an individual, I, I felt really happy and, and it's, it's a decision that I, that I felt very, you know, very uh, uh, grateful that I, that I took. And, and yeah, I think that's, that's my story overall. Character. Uh, I'm from Michigan originally. Uh, I grew up on the west side of the state. Um, Michigan uh, holds a special place in my heart. I went here for undergrad and was gone for almost 13 years and frankly never thought I would move back to Michigan. Um, I always um, had an interest or spark for adventure um, and knowing myself more through getting to know other cultures. Um, I lived abroad for quite a long time um, and then was based in DC working for an intergovernmental um, international agency. Um, and when it came time to decide to further my career, and I also had at that point um, been adjunct lecturing at a university in DC and knew that I wanted to um, have an opening to academics in the future. Um, there was really no other choice but Michigan. Um, out of the schools that I was looking at, the um, kind of offer for inter interdisciplinary and work that Michigan provides um, and just kind of the funding mechanisms that um, facilitate that um, gave me kind of the push that I needed to, I guess, to come back to Michigan. Um, and I've been really, really pleased to be here. I mean, just to give you one example, um, the university has a program called M Cubed, um, which I'm hoping to maybe use for a postdoc here um, that facilitates um, inter-school um, collaboration um, by funding their students through getting three separate schools within the university to tag on to an interdisciplinary project. Um, and I think just that unique um, 
kind of, especially, you could probably speak to this more, but um, in higher education now, being a truly research-based um, hard money school um, provides um, a few more unique collaborations in the field of public health than you would otherwise being at a school that's funded um, by what we might call soft money um, uh, or project kind of based resources. So. Yeah, one more, please go ahead. So mine is a little different. As I said before, I'm from the Virgin Islands, um, but I didn't think about graduate school until I was in my junior year of college. Um, so I was a politics major when I started. Um, and I went to DC for my undergrad to do advocacy for education. Um, so as many of you guys know, um, Virgin Islands, I'm from the US Virgin Islands, particularly St. Thomas. Um, so education wasn't, my education at least in high school wasn't as developed as my peers were. Um, and I didn't really realize that until I got into undergrad um, where like my math skills was probably like two years behind everybody else. Um, so it was really hard. So I really didn't think um, I really could make an impact in science as I thought other than through like advocacy through education and education policy specifically. Um, but then I got thrusted into this um, research opportunity at University of Michigan um, my junior year on um, the summer before my senior year. Um, and I was in the lab I'm in right now actually doing research as an undergrad for the first time in my life. And I love the experience. I love Michigan. I've met a lot of people it was through the um, College of Pharmacy and they connected me through to the chemistry department, through PIBS, um, different programs under Rackham. And that's how I figured out I wanted to go to graduate school and specifically graduate school at U of M. Um, they kind of made a community here for me that made me feel comfortable enough to feel like, okay, well, maybe I can actually do this. I can do science. Let's try it a little bit. Um, but yeah, so it was definitely, um, University of Michigan definitely gives you a community that inspires growth. Um, I visited, after when I started applying to grad schools, I visited some other universities like Vanderbilt, um, some schools in um, Florida, um, one Washington State, and I don't think any of them fostered a community like University of Michigan. Um, it gives you the cutting edge research that you want without feeling that you're being pinned against your classmates regularly. And that's definitely an environment I didn't want. Um, and the University of Michigan definitely helped create a very comfortable environment where like, okay, you learn at your own pace, you get what you get done, and we're gonna try to make you the best scientist you can. Um, so then that, that's particularly why I chose University of Michigan. They kind of inspired me to do research in the first place. Um, so I kind of stuck it for the long haul at University of Michigan, so. Thank you, another question from our audience? Thank you, Melissa. Joe, uh, I know you're not a device man, but pretend you're a science fiction writer for a moment with your background. Tell us about something that spin, uh, spin uh, tronics would look like, you know, 10, 20, 50 years in the future. So I think what I like about Spintronics is the idea that it wouldn't have to be something that looks wildly different, but that you could replace the electronics we have now with Spintronic devices. The, certainly the goal in the field is just to be able to take, oh, here's an electronic transistor, let's have a spin-based transistor instead. And so you get a, a future that on the surface might not look a whole lot different than today, but the hopes would be devices that could be certainly more energy efficient if not better or faster in other device benchmarks that I am not an expert in. And so, whereas the, the future of quantum computing, which again is not what I do, but is something that people often think of when I talk about my work, that could look like a very different future, but Spintronics would hopefully look a lot like what we have today, but better. And I realize that but better isn't incredibly satisfying. So I'm not gonna go write a science fiction novel based on that. But the, the idea would be doing what we're doing now better in a way that wouldn't be a huge paradigm shift. Is that? Okay, great. It's kind of directed at your end, but it, it, I have a follow-up comment for all of you. But um, you were mentioning a lot about the students who um, go to a <clears throat> kind of a backup college or a baseline college. <clears throat> in terms of 
dealing with that, you were talking about giving information to students. Have you also looked into encouraging students that go to these schools to continue on to higher uh, graduate schools, such as Michigan, where you can get a, a, an amazing degree? And this is a lot of us, I kind of speak from personal basis that, you know, I, I went to a, a university that was comfortable for me as well, but I also ended up coming to University of Michigan. So I think a, a, another pathway of solving that might be trying to figure out a way to get these students to apply to graduate school and always apply to the best graduate schools, regardless of, of what field they're in. But the other comment for the rest of the field, since a lot of you do field work around the world, um, to spend time looking at the people you're working with who are from that local area to consider mm, maybe they would be a good candidate to come to the University of Michigan or come to the United States to do graduate work. And because there's a lot of wonderful people out there who'd never get an opportunity, but they're working with you and I think it would be something that would be worthwhile to just put in the back of your mind while you're international traveling. Well, I think that's an excellent point. And I think, uh, um, honestly speaking, I feel like providing information to the students is uh, relatively less important than encouraging them to realize that they have uh, way more potential they, than they think they have. Because uh, um, in this case, we are talking about uh, many students that they are from underprivileged background and the, the, their social surroundings uh, is kind of uh, hard for them to open their eyes. If uh, everybody else from the high school is just uh, go to a, a nearby, uh, nearby college or she, uh, they, the, the students never met anyone from the um, University of Michigan, then they may feel like uh, going to the University of Michigan is such a distant idea that, that never occurred to their mind and they were just uh, go with the norm. So I think uh, um, related to your point, uh, encouraging them to go to uh, the best uh, graduate school or um, go to the best undergraduate college is, 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 a, is the same idea to help them to realize that they have more potential. And once they have that idea, what I mean, once we can implement, implant that idea into their mind, then they have a computer, they have an internet, they have Google, they can figure out the relatively easy. So I think that's also good. Part B was a bit of a comment and a bit of a question. Does anybody want to take that as a question? So, and how are you, please go ahead. Oh, I was looking at, no, 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 sorry. I was looking at the, it looked like you wanted to. Oh, uh, yes, I, um, oh, I, I was uh, going to say that when, um, or so a lot of graduate students who um, work at the research site that I met in Uganda, one of something that, um, uh, the, the site is the research site of Uganda University of Mokberry. Um, It's their field station, we're sort of guests there, but um, there are a lot of undergraduates from that university that um, are, are fantastic. It sort of, it specializes more in, like the research they're doing in the forest is like more ecology based and not plants. So there um, tend to not be like a lot of the undergrads who are interested in working in the forest are not um, so obsessed with chimpanzees and that they, they like them, but it's kind of like, um, oh, you're just, you are studying these like fluffy <laughs> creatures. We're very interested in these insects. And, and so I, I, uh, there's, yeah, there's like a whole social world of people studying different animals and like what it means to study reptiles. Anyway, um, but, but, but uh, they, so a lot of times um, if graduate students, if we're, we get enough funding, we can have, can hire um, like a recent, under, a recent undergraduate to be our research assistant. And then they can get really direct experience in collecting data, um, like just developing all these skills, maybe conducting an independent project. And then they're in a really good position to apply to a, um, a, a, a university and where, where, like, um, I guess anywhere in the world because these students are from different places. But, but that has been something that, um, ra like, that uh, Rackham Funds can support is the funding for, for an assistant. But Excellent. Thank you. Ines? Yes. Um, very impressed with the panel again this year. Thank you, Rackham, for choosing a diverse set of topics. Thank you, panelists, for sharing your projects and your passion, and it shows. Um, I have a question for Maribel. Um, I was interested in terms of your findings and your research about the 
role of diet in terms of maintaining the balance that you mentioned in terms of the oral microbes and also is the impact of diet if you have found that different from in terms of your gut microbe system versus your oral in terms of my, maintaining health and balance um it's hard to say um, i'm really at the cusp of my research so it's really starting to it, natural product research is really it's a really long process um, extracting compounds and then characterizing it really takes a long time especially like sometimes there's not enough of the compound. Um, and specifically because my research doesn't necessarily focus on diet, I can't particularly say much on that topic, but it, yes, like from what I've studied and what I've researched so far, I wanna understand, um, that's what we're trying to correlate, right? So we're trying to correlate how your diet and what you're incorporating and incorporating into your system, how it affects the microbiome within your mouth, and if that microbiome then affects other places, like your gut, and it affects other systemic diseases and how it affects you later on. So that's, that's kind of like what our whole end goal is. Like, we're hoping that we can find these correlations so that we can have faster processes and more efficient processes of finding these biomarkers and finding ways to see, okay, if you're having an illness, what is it? And like, being able to kind of like, have a faster way of I guess, breaking down and figuring out what sort of diseases that you might have and what issue you might have. Um, but in case of like specific diet, it does affect it. Um, so right now we have samples from like um, a couple of patients. We have like saliva samples and they have different variations of health. And then we're comparing them for what we're doing in the lab and seeing if their metabolites are the same, seeing if metabolites are different, if certain things are being produced when you're having a certain disease especially particularly in your mouth or in your body and your system, and seeing if how we can correlate these. Are there specific metabolites that are produced more in your mouth or in your gut when you have a specific disease? And why is this happening? What is producing it? Okay, is, is this metabolite causing these like inflammations? Is it causing something to you? Or is it something that's an adverse effect? That is this disease producing this metabolite? Can we use that as a way to detect other diseases or can we use it as a way to treat it? Um, this is kind of the questions that we're really trying to ask in our, my research. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Right. Other questions? I'm going to jump in with the opportunity to ask one. This is actually a question for Kara. So I understood that, um, you know, these, uh, when you're thinking about whole populations and having protection, there's these kind of local groupings can be important if they if they kind of aren't aren't on board i'm wondering you know when you talked about um when you go around the world england the united states and africa like are there what's the same about how you think about the problems in those different locations and what is different um, so i mean i'm kind of specifically a int bit interested in our potential of being decertified here in the united states and what lessons can be learned about that from your from the work across the world Often starting with the same sort of kind of demographic characteristics that you may um, include in any sort of survey um, design to be able to identify these populations. Um, but really the, the reasons underlying why those clusterings of demographic characteristics um, exist are going to um, be in place for diverse reasons. Um, you know, the U.S. in particular, um, you find um, clustering of under unvaccinated around certain religious affiliation, um, and that in part also is more present in states where there are um, religious exemptions to state laws for, for vaccination. And so I think there is a policy component of revisiting that, and some states have um, taken the route of um, doing away with religious exemption, exemptions um, and um, sticking only with medical exemptions. Um, but what you actually have, or we've observed in the US and states that have gone that route is you've seen an increase in medical exemptions. So there's a lot of, I think, just open dialogue that needs to happen around this issue, um, engaging with practitioners um, and just kind of the individual perspective that what matters here is 
society and the community, um, not only the individual, but that's hard in a setting where um, kind of the potential risk for an adverse event following immunization is more real to people um, in eradication elimination settings than the risk of disease acquisition. Um, even in some of our care settings here, it's so rare to see um, certain vaccine preventable diseases that um, young physicians no longer kind of um, quickly detect um, early signs. And so there's a whole kind of educational component that, that needs to happen. Um, and then globally, um, I think that um, there's a lot of um, work, um, funding work that's been done by a few um, huge philanthropic organizations to make access um, barriers um, fewer. Um, and we see um, now newer vaccines that are common in, in high resource settings like the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, rotavirus, HPV, um, extending to, to more populations, but you still want to be able to detect around certain, um, almost thinking of um, certain kind of demographic characteristics or um, uh, other characteristics as, as risk kind of profiling um, to be able to ensure that programmatic intervention takes into consideration those clusterings of, of individuals who potentially could be under or unvaccinated and therefore put the whole of the community at risk. Thank you. Last week, oh, well, one last question. This is your last question, thank you. Nope, all you. I'd like to ask you about your experience as a member of the Rackham community, the smaller community inside the larger community of the University of Michigan whether or not any of you knew each other uh, in some other context before you were assembled uh, as a panel, and if there has been any particular experience that any of you would like to talk about that has uh, been a significant contributor to your feeling a part of the Rackham community. Maybe a panelist that hasn't had the chance to speak yet. So the question is, um, if I'm feeling that, if I'm gain, gaining support from the Rockham community, and if I feel like I'm part of this community. Um, so my department is up in the north, so I think I haven't met any of these individuals before because I'm up in the north, sort of, I don't know if you guys been to the music school, but we're kind of on our own and we're actually building a dance building next to us so that we can collaborate so much more easier. But I've always um, reached out to Rockham whenever I needed help. I think whether it was applying for faculty positions or traveling overseas or just raising funding for my dissertation. So I've been here a lot for those workshops that I had um, that talk about like what it what it's like to be interviewing as a faculty member for a faculty member and writing diversity statements and all those small things. I had to travel down here to learn that, and then I've had uh, multiple opportunities to interact with uh, people who all, all went to the same workshops. Do you guys have any other thing to contribute to? Sorry, I could speak a little on um, like different groups for Rackham. Um, so I'm actually part of two like major student groups for Rackham. So it's on Rackham Student Government and Students of Color of Rackham. So I'm on eboards for both. <laughs> um, so really busy. Um, so I can speak more of a dynamics for like at least what I definitely think Rackham is definitely trying to push for graduate students here. Um, so at least what I've seen being an incoming student and relatively new, they're really trying to push the graduate student experience, trying to get more availability for students to interact with each other. Um, I can definitely say, at least with my department, I don't even see students from my department very often. Um, we're very lab-based and in our work all the time. It's really hard to interact with other people, especially outside of chemistry. Um, so 
really, I think Rackham was really trying to push hard for encouraging students to get to know each other. Um, and I think through those groups, I've definitely been able to meet a lot of new people, um, people I probably never would have interacted with because like I'm in a really hard science, um, people from school of education, kinesiology, things like that, that I would never have the opportunity to just because our paths don't cross. Um, we have like annual like events like fall ball, which is like our like, I guess prom of graduate school, I guess, I don't know. Um, and that's definitely something that's really great because it's a collaboration of different schools in Rackham. Um, so I think like they're definitely pushing to foster more community here and Dope just because the University of Michigan in general is such a big campus and such a big population of students, it is hard to kind of feel like you can definitely settle your ground here because there's so much going on, especially with the undergrad life, kind of undergrads take over. I think you really need a summer here as a graduate student to really see what campus looks like as a graduate student by yourself, That's true. rather than like during the hustle of bustle during the regular semester. Um, but I think Rackham is doing, really doing a good job trying to foster that community here. Um, I think at least especially based off of my friends and peers from other universities and like what their comments are, I think Rackham is doing a pretty good job so far and like I'm trying to improve that. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. So we're at the hour. Oh, I'm, and uh, well, I think we, we need to close the session at now. It's, it's uh, 1130. I would just like to take a brief moment to, to talk um, just to mention, you know, I think we saw the both the depth of the scholarship, but then also how the scholarship matters and not just matters to society and our public, but also to you yourselves. And, uh, and, and specifically then how uh, the experience of being a graduate student is not just about the research and scholarship. There's these other dimensions that you all were kind enough to identify for us. And uh, that really, I find very gratifying uh, because, um, uh, because, of, because of just the, the, the experience is a, is, a, is a long one, is a significant one. And so just knowing about all the ways in which we can make an impact at, at this point in your careers is really wonderful to see. So with that, let's take a moment to thank our panelists for their time. It's been a really wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if there, you know, I know we weren't able to take all the questions. I'm sorry for that. So maybe if I, if you're interested in coming down to ask, we could we could have that as well. So thank you. Thank you for joining us today.